Our first speaker is a distinguished academic, writer, and jurist who happens to be a research fellow at the Hoover Institution specializing in international law and treaties, constitutional federalism, and American politics and law. Uh, David Davenport received the BA with distinction in international relations from Stanford University and a JD from the University of Kansas School of Law. He served in various capacities at Pepperdine University, spanning a 25-year period, culminating with being named president of Pepperdine from 1985 through 2000. During his tenure as president, student enrollments increased, and the reputation and visibility of the university was raised. He co-founded Common Sense California and the Davenport Institute for Public Engagement and Civic Leadership. Davenport has served on several boards and commissions engaged in bipartisan reforms such as California Forward and the California Performance Commission. A frequent speaker on domestic and world affairs, Davenport has written book chapters and journal articles uh, addressing topics on values in a free society and legal threats to American values. With co-author Gordon Lloyd, Davenport has examined the political philosophy of Herbert Hoover in two books, The New Deal and Modern American Conservatism, A Defining Rivalry, published in 2013, and Rugged Individualism, Dead or Alive, which is the subject of his talk today. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome David Davenport. Thank you, Tom, and uh, members of the Hoover family, and uh, ladies and gentlemen. I thought for a little bit we were going to have a couple of great, great grandchildren from the Hoover family, but they're already asleep, so <laughs> don't let that be a signal to you as to what you should be doing uh, during this talk. Uh, you're very brave to invite me and, and to have me here. Earlier in my career, I was an attorney, a group not always known for its brevity of speech. And now for many years I've been an academic, a group not always known for its clarity of speech. Uh, more than that, I'm a Californian now, and uh, I'm told, I've never actually seen it, but I'm told there's a sign at the border heading from California into Oregon, and it says, leaving California, resume normal behavior. Um, and so I'm, I'm trying to engage in normal behavior now for my couple of days with you in so, uh, Gordon Lloyd and I have enjoyed working on uh, this book, uh, which does have a great deal to say about Herbert Hoover. Uh, what Gordon and I like to do in our work, we call go back to come back. We like to go back into American history, not really for the purpose of just studying history, but to see what we can learn to come back to public policy today. And so in this book, we try to go back uh, and understand the concept of rugged individualism uh, in order to come back and see what we can learn about uh, American policy today. And, and I would say, I think it's fair to say, to, to start with, that rugged individualism has sort of had its ups and downs uh, over the years. As Henry Kissinger once said, even a paranoid has some real enemies. Uh, and uh, rugged individualism has had some real enemies uh, over the years and perhaps even today. Uh, in particular, I think it would be fair to say that uh, economists have attacked rugged individualism as a, a sort of a form of selfishness in their view, and sociologists have also attacked it as sort of anti-communitarian, and again, uh, sort of a form of selfishness. Uh, but in our view, uh, it is a very important concept, rooted, as you'll see in a few moments, in American history. <coughs> and one that could be and should be of continuing value to us today, but one which continues to be under threat. And in our book, we look at two kinds of, uh, of threats, or we look at rugged individualism from two different points of view. Uh, sort of the political point of view, what kind of policies encourage or damage rugged individualism. And then we also look at some of the academic ideas, the world of ideas, and what kind of ideas are gaining traction with the American people that, again, might either enhance or hamper uh, rugged individualism. And early in the book, we have uh, our own matrix, quite simple. 
Uh, sometimes academics get a little too caught up with their uh, charts and graphs, but I think this one will be very easy to follow. Rugged individualism, good, bad, dead or alive. Uh, and so we ask you to think about, as you read the book or as you listen to this talk, do you think rugged individualism is a good thing or a bad thing? Uh, and do you think it's dead or alive? And I, I will just tell you, you, you could really locate yourself anywhere here and have company. Uh, because throughout history and even today, uh, there are people, President Obama, for example, talked about rugged individualism on more than one occasion. So we, he, would, he would say it's alive, but that that's a bad thing. Uh, and others would say, no, it's basically dead today, and that's either a good thing or a bad thing. Uh, my co-author and I believe it is alive, but barely. Uh, and we're glad it's alive, and we wish it were livelier, livelier as, as I'll talk about here today. So that, that matrix is for you to keep in mind. So just a quick run at the, at the history of this. Uh, certainly um, American individualism was very much planting, planted in our DNA at the founding. G.K. Chesterton fam famously said that America is the only nation founded on a creed. And certainly part of that creed uh, was individualism. And I would say, if you don't remember anything else about rugged individualism, this little summary, I think, really captures the, the essence of it. People who came to this country as uh, pilgrims, as pioneers, as settlers, as colonists, uh, who left something behind and, and came here on a big adventure, what they really essentially wanted was for the important decisions of their lives not to be made by a church, and not to be made by a king or queen, and not to be decided by the social class into which you were born, but that the key decisions about their lives could be made by them as individuals. That's really the essence of individualism. We're tired of other people making decisions for us. We would like to live in a land where we're able to make uh, our own decisions about our lives. And so, of course, the Declaration of Independence very much is about individualism. Uh, believe in life and liberty and the pursuit of happiness. And we're unhappy because uh, the king has really violated our individual rights and freedoms and, and has failed in important ways to protect them as government should. And so the Declaration of Independence really articulated our freedoms and our individualism. And then the Constitution was drafted in such a way as to actually protect them. Certainly by, uh, by that I mean the Bill of Rights, the first 10 amendments which are very much a listing of individual rights that should be protected against, primarily, intrusion by the government. Uh, but there are also, there's also, inside the Constitution, a whole variety of checks and balances and balances and separations of power, which frankly are coming under attack more and more today. But they are there in order to keep the government out of our individual realm, uh, away from uh, our individual rights so that they may be protected under the Constitution. Now, when you think about rugged individualism, you probably, the, the image, I should have asked you this, the image that comes to mind is sort of John Wayne uh, on the American frontier. The American frontier was an especially good time uh, for American rugged individualism. Uh, and Tocqueville, when Tocqueville wrote his Democracy in America in the, in the early 1800s, um, he made the point that the, the vast land and sort of the pioneering spirit in America weren't just a lifestyle, but they were also a culture that helped democracy. Uh, and so the free availability of land to people helped them establish and assert their individual rights and learn to work and cooperate together. A very famous academic writing in, in the 1890s was the Frontier Thesis by a professor at the University of Wisconsin, Frederick Jackson Turner. And again, he describes the American frontier as part of American democracy, that people learn how to work together, how to cooperate together. They learn divisions of labor. They learned how to survive. They learn how to protect themselves. All of these lessons, uh, he said, uh, were learned, really lessons of democracy that were learned on the American frontier. And then I have just a little note at the bottom that the frontier did involve collaboration. Sometimes people say, well, 
how can you claim that there was rugged individualism on the American frontier? Because people were always in wagon trains and helping each other build houses. And, and certainly we acknowledge that rugged individuals can collaborate with other rugged individuals. Just because you and I decide to work together on something doesn't mean we aren't rugged individuals anymore. And, and clearly rugged individuals did wisely join together in wagon trains and protect each other and help each other build their early huts and houses. But that doesn't mean they weren't rugged individuals. They were choosing of their own consent to join with other people. That will be very different from the kinds of things that we'll see um, uh, uh, as we move into the role of government. But in the late uh, 1800s, early 1900s, the progressives began to attack rugged individualism. It's, it is the fact that in 1890, the American Census Bureau, the U.S. Bureau of Census, quit counting the migration of Americans to the West and said officially, the American frontier is now closed. What that meant, effectively, is we've reached the Pacific Ocean. There's no more West uh, to conquer, and so we will no longer keep those statistics. And so the progressives began to argue, well, if the American frontier is closed now, we're going to have to learn to live together in different ways. We're going to have to band together more. We're going to have to live in cities. Uh, we're going to need more government if we're going to make this country work now that the frontier has closed. And some of the progressives were very specific in saying that this is a good thing because now we can get rid of this awful American rugged individualism. And so Charles Beard, one of the progressives, uh, wrote an essay called The Myth of American Rugged Individualism. And uh, uh, President Obama, I, I like to joke, must have been channeling his inner Charles Beard uh, when he gave that famous, you didn't build that talk. I don't know if you remember President Obama's talk where he said, you know, if you built a business, you just think you built that because you didn't build the internet and the highways and everything that were needed to make that business work. I thought, my, my father was a small businessman, and I thought it was, well, but I did pay the taxes to build all of those things. So in a way, I did build that. But regardless, uh, his same point was really the point that Charles Beard was making in his essay, The Myth of, of American Rugged Individualism. Because Beard said, well, on one hand, American businessmen say they want rugged individualism. But on the other hand, they want the government to build them ports and bridges and roads and all kinds of sort of central things. And, and so he says that really, that really cuts against rugged individualism. John Dewey, another progressive, mostly known for his educational work, uh, referred to it as ragged individualism. Now the country can finally get past this ragged individualism and we can move into cities and we can work more together and, most important, have more government. Well, rugged individualism had its defenders in the progressive era. And I would say foremost among those was Herbert Hoover. Uh, and in fact, Herbert Hoover coined the term rugged individualism. Um, uh, I think Frederick Jackson Turner could have, probably should have, in his essay uh, on the American, essays on the American West, he describes it in vivid detail. He just never quite gets to that phrase, rugged individualism. And so it was left to Herbert Hoover in the 1928 presidential campaign to coin the term uh, rugged individualism. And Hoover had done <coughs> actually a lot of good thinking about individualism. In 1922, Hoover wrote an essay that I hope you've read, and if you haven't, I hope you will read, called American Individualism. And it's widely considered by liberals and conservatives alike as one of the best philosophical statements written by any president of the United States. Very, very thoughtful. And the, the sense of it was, if you know your Herbert Hoover history, which I'm sure you do, being here at his hometown, uh, he had spent many of the years before 1922 in Europe leading uh, large relief efforts. Uh, and when he came back from Europe, he was really kind of shocked because he saw America drifting toward some of the forms of collectivism that he had seen in Europe. And his thought was, why, you know, why would we voluntarily want to give in? Europe is giving in to collectivisms and totalitarianism of various forms, socialism, communism, fascism. Why would we want to do that in this country? Because he said, in this country, we have what he called the American system of rugged individualism. And then he always added, 
and it's accompanied by equality of opportunity. The reason it works in this country is that people have equality of opportunity and they have a chance to pursue their individualism uh, in, in the ways that they wish. And so he would always say, it's not some kind of laissez-faire, devil take the hindmost form of individualism, but it's a, an American system of rugged individualism that's accompanied by equality of opportunity. And so in 1932, Hoover and Franklin Roosevelt uh, would not only clash as two presidential candidates, but as Hoover himself said, uh, this is not a campaign just between two people. <coughs> this is a campaign between two philosophies uh, of government. The American system, which is of course what, what Hoover supported, against the New Deal, with Franklin Roosevelt basically saying, it's time to do away with <coughs> individualism, <coughs> and we need lots more administration, and we need more central government planning of the economy, we need emergency measures, and we need to grow this, this federal government of ours. Uh, and so we really had a clash in the 1930s uh, between Hoover's rugged individualism and, if you will, FDR's New Deal. Uh, Gordon and I uh, argue that if you wanted to pick two caricatures, cartoon characters, if you will, to kind of illustrate this clash, you would have Hoover's rugged individual, that's our thought of how he would be depicted, against Roosevelt's forgotten man. Because Roosevelt's idea was, we should stop making policy based on individualism, and we need to start making American policy based on the forgotten man, uh, on the man who has been left behind by uh, society. Uh, and, and so these two caricatures, if you will, also sort of clash in, in policy making beginning in the 1930s. But the New Deal sort of won out, clearly. Uh, and the New Deal, I think, has become the paradigm for American economic and domestic policy for 80 years and still coming. Uh, this is the book that Gordon and I wrote earlier that really developed that theme. Um, after other wars and national emergencies, the government usually pared back to its pre-war levels. You may remember in the 1920s, after the uh, World War I, there was the return to normalcy. Uh, by, by Warren Harding, there was Calvin Coolidge meeting with his budget director every week to pare the federal government back down to size. Uh, but uh, unfortunately, following the New Deal and World War II, the federal government was never pared back and just began a period now of 80 years of growth and, and going. So then we proceed to look at um, rugged individualism sort of in the modern era. Uh, and we look at two revolutions, if you will, in the modern era, and ask ourselves, how did rugged, rugged individualism fare? One was the Great Society Revolution, where Lyndon Johnson grew the government, federal government, more and more and more. Uh, Johnson was just a great, was just a classic uh, character. Uh, I remember reading one time that he was going uh, in a campaign vehicle, and at one place he wasn't even scheduled to speak, but he was so enthusiastic that he grabbed a bullhorn and he yelled out, in this campaign we're for a lot of things and we're against mighty few. Uh, and that was sort of the great society government. We were for a lot of things, we wanted wars on poverty, we wanted, war, you know, we wanted to fix the inner city, we wanted to fix the countryside, uh, and we were against mighty few things. There were just very few things that LBJ thought the government couldn't do. But, this I would add, when LBJ uh, carried out health care reform of his day, he at least left room for rugged <coughs> individualism. And ultimately, that's our view, by the way, in this book. Not that we shouldn't have safety nets, not, not that we should ignore the forgotten man, but we could at least, at the table of public policy, leave room for policies that continue to recognize rugged individualism in this country. So, when OBJ enacted Medicare in the 1960s, he didn't federalize all of health care, but if you wanted to continue to have your own policy, if your employer wanted to continue to provide health insurance policies, all of those choices were still open to you. So, the Medicare safety net, which was constructed by the Great Society, stood alongside other policies that were still open 
to, if you will, rugged individuals. So there was a place even in the great society for both the rugged individual on healthcare as well as the forgotten man, the safety man. Um, and this is, I think, a lesson we couldn't afford to learn today. The Reagan Revolution was probably the other big revolution of our modern time. And I would say the Reagan Revolution really helped, rhetorically at least, recenter uh, our government uh, and America's relationship with government. You may remember in, in Reagan's uh, uh, addresses, what did he say? Government isn't the solution to our problems, government is the problem. Uh, and, and although he was never really able to achieve all the things he wanted to in terms of sort of paring back the role of the federal government, he did rhetorically sort of reset the relationship between people and the government. And I would say at the same time, he accomplished several things. He accomplished one of the largest tax cuts uh, that we've seen in the modern era. Uh, he, did, uh, he restored block grants to the states where they could carry things out. So although he didn't get as much policy done, I think rhetorically, he very much kind of re-energized uh, rugged individualism. So one of the things we do in the book is we sort of look at various administrations and various governments and we say, which of those were friendly to rugged individualism? Or in the case of the Great Society, at least left room for rugged individual policies and which did not. The other thing we look at in the book are Cycle, uh, uh, philosophical debates uh, and how did those affect rugged individualism? And so one of the debates that we examine is uh, what President Obama has called the biggest issue of our time, which is uh, income inequality, uh, which as I said, Obama has called the defining challenge of our time. And I, I don't really urge you to read, this was really all launched, or a lot of it was launched by Thomas Piketty's book, uh, capital of the 21st century. And I don't, we, we read it for you. I don't, I don't know that you need to read the whole book. But uh, basically, Piketty argues that we have a major social problem, which is the upper 1% of the 1% of the 1% are getting richer, and everyone else is not in relative terms. And in Piketty's view, that is a social problem that demands a government solution. Uh, and he says safety nets are not enough, uh, education is not enough, equality of opportunity is not enough. These are things we used to rely on in our society when people needed help or needed a boost. He said we need, he says we need income redistribution. We need to take money from the wealthy and we need to give it to other people. Um, he argues in the book, and I haven't seen a lot of attention to this, he thinks when, when we complain that, that government's percent of spending has gone up in our society, 20%, 25%, 30%, he says it should be 50%. Because he says only the government can spend money fairly uh, to all people. So the government should be taking 50% of your money and redistributing it uh, to other people. He says that's the only thing that would be fair. And obviously what Piketty is advancing is what you'd have to call a form of soft I say soft because he doesn't at least call for a revolution yet, a form of soft Marxism. And obviously it'd be hard to think of any ideas out there that would be less friendly to rugged individualism than to say, let's start taking half of everybody's money and giving it away to other people. Um, and so that's one side of that, uh, of that debate. Uh, and I think, <coughs> and we address um, in, our, in our book some of the counter uh, arguments and counter issues, and we might want to talk about those in a question and answer if you would like. Then, there's also a philosophical debate, besides the economic one, there is a sociological debate. Um, and the argument is that American individualism has become and is going to continue to become more and more selfish. Uh, two books really took this point of view, Habits of the Heart, uh, by Robert Bella and several of his colleagues, and Bowling Alone by Robert Putnam. And their argument is that <coughs> our Americans are becoming less and less involved in civic life and more and more selfish. Now, the evidence is kind of interesting. I mean, Americans are bowling alone. Uh, I don't do a lot of bowling, so I'm not sure I quite get the culture of it here. But um, uh, we, we don't join bowling leagues anymore. Instead, we go to the bowling alley and we bowl alone. Well, my, my view of this would be that the forms of civic life and engagement have changed quite a bit, but that that doesn't mean it has gone away. Um, 
my children are very much involved in lives with other people, but it's mostly through devices they hold in their hands and follow-up they do from that. They don't necessarily go down to the bowling alley for their engagement, but, but they're not not engaged. They're just engaged in, in other ways. And so, and, and, and the evidence suggests that America continues to be the most philanthropic, the most generous, uh, society on earth, we build more churches, we build more civic organizations, we build more uh, charities. Um, and so to me, the evidence that Americans are becoming selfish is relatively weak. Um, Francis Fukuyama, who's a scholar now at, at Stanford University, uh, across the, the way from the Hoover Institution, made an interesting statement. He said, Americans are anti-status, perhaps, but they're not selfish. In other words, we don't particularly like the government taking our money and spending it for us or telling us what to do with our lives. We're not really that excited about statism, but we're not selfish either. We, we are joiners. We are givers. We are collaborators. And, and again, I think the, the evidence compared to other societies certainly uh, bears that out. And of course today, we wrote this book long before the current health care debate, um, the other policy debate today, uh, where rugged individualism is very much a, cl a question, uh, is Obamacare. Uh, where, I mean, the fact that you're required to buy a, a policy uh, of insurance is a, a pretty obvious invasion, I think, of your individual rights. The elimination of individual choice. Um, this time, uh, it's not based upon, uh, it leaves no room for the rugged individual at all, everybody needs to have the same kind of policy. I remember getting a call from both of my millennial sons, who don't pay that much attention to politics, and they said, Dad, our health care is, my health insurance is being declared illegal, and I can't have it anymore. And I said, well, why is that? And they said, because it doesn't have pregnancy coverage. Dad, I'm not going to get pregnant. I said, yeah, I know, boys, that this is, you know, this is how it works. When the government, I mean, the government says you can keep your policy, the government says you can keep your doctor, but in fact, they have certain kind of standards that they believe need to be applicable to everyone. So no longer do we really have room for the rugged individual to have his or her kind of policy, for businesses to provide policies for their employees, but now we all need to have sort of the same kind of policy. Again, very much undercutting uh, rugged individualism. So, in closing, uh, I'm, I felt the need to give some hope for the future. Um, I'm a little bit like, I was driving, literally, I was driving down the 405 freeway in Los Angeles one day, and it, I mean, you have plenty of time when you're on California freeways to look at license plates and bumper stickers, and so there was a bumper sticker ahead that looked interesting, and I kind of pulled up on it, and in big letters, there is no hope, and then in small letters underneath, but I could be wrong. Uh, so, <laughs> I guess that's sort of my view as I'm getting older. I'm not sure there's hope, but I really need to have some hope. So I'm gonna, I'm, so I'm gonna give you a little hope for the future of, of rugged individualism. And in our book, we list some reasons to be uh, optimistic and some reasons to be pessimistic. Certainly, the political climate is not very hopeful for rugged individualism. Uh, the federal government continues to grow. It continues to take over more and more of things that states and individuals used to be free to do, like education, healthcare, uh, on and on uh, we go. I think another reason to be pessimistic is, um, and, and John and Margaret can maybe correct me here during the Q&A, um, uh, they're more pro-millennial than I am. Um, that's because I've managed a lot of millennials, so I'm, I'm that's trying to manage. <laughs> yes, no, I understand. Um, uh, one problem, I think, with a younger generation is that for them, individual liberty has become a bit of an abstraction. They don't really get how that affects their lives. And, I mean, that's not really their fault. Their whole lives, they've lived in an era of big government. And, again, I have three kids who are in this age range, and they say to me, well, Dad, if it gets done, why do you care so much whether the government does it or somebody else does it, you know, a church or, you know, some other group, as long as it's getting done. So, Th their notion of big government being an enemy of, of their lives or their notion of big government sort of taking over their lives, it's just an abstract idea for them. Every once in a while, they'll see something where, like when their health policy gets declared illegal. And I said, you know, that's not only stupidity, but that's government overreach. Oh, yeah, okay. Or, you know, you have to.
to wear a helmet or pads when you skateboard or when you, you know, ski or snowboard. I mean, that's considered, in their view, a bit of government overreach. Or when they read that the mayor of New York says you can't buy a 16-ounce soda, or that you can buy two 8-ounce sodas, that's viewed as stupidity. I tried to tell them, yes, that's also kind of government overreach, taking away your individual choice to decide how much Coca-Cola uh, you really want to drink. So I, I'm just saying, I think one, one reason to be pessimistic is I think younger generations see individualism uh, and, and, and individual liberty as a bit of an abstraction. I think another reason to be pessimistic, I'm, I'm trying to get the pessimism out of the way first, I'll get to the hope. Um, <laughs> and that is the way we are coddling uh, the present generation. Um, I've worked on college campuses most of my life, and I work with the helicopter parents and the kids who don't want to have to hear trigger words or be made uncomfortable or hear microaggressions. I have a faculty friend who says, well, all I know to do if there's a microaggression, I'll have to launch a macroaggression. You know? So you know, we don't, we, we don't, they, don't want to, they don't want to hear microaggressions, they don't want to hear trigger words. And frankly, we're coddling kids. They're not going to go off to college and grow as individuals and, and, and develop their own sense of liberty and direction if we coddle them in the ways we are now. So I think that's a reason to be pessimistic about the future uh, of rugged individualism, is the way we're coddling uh, kids today. Um, well, we could, we could go on. Um, Polls, I'm, I'm a little troubled by polls that show that young people are m much more open to socialism today than they have been before. Now, when you read the polls carefully, they don't know what socialism is, um, but they, they think it's probably okay. You know, that, that doesn't bode well, I don't think, for the future of American individuals. But as I said, there might be some reasons to be optimistic, too, uh, uh, and, and that is that Rugged individualism does its best work and thrives the most when it's on new frontiers. Uh, you think of the, of, of the frontiers of the American West, a time of rugged individualism. And, and frontiers can be of, of different kinds. John Kennedy's new frontier as people went into space and, and all the excitement that created. Well, young people today are living on new frontiers. They're living on primarily new media frontiers and new business frontiers and new social frontiers. And that could be a time of optimism for uh, individuals. My kids spend more time by themselves than we ever did in my generation. Now, they're connected to people when they're doing it. It's called networked individualism. You're on your own, but you're at least in touch with people and communicating with people. So these new frontiers uh, may be a, a, a sign of hopefulness. I would say immigrants not all immigrants, but many immigrants are a, sign, a hopeful sign for rugged individualism. My, my co-author Gordon, when he travels, he says he himself is an immigrant. And he says, in any city I go to in America, almost always, when I get in a taxi cab, I'm being driven by an immigrant. And the story the immigrant always wants to tell me is how he or she is working so hard at this job so that their kids can have a more meaningful future in America. And he said, of course, that's the way I was raised. My parents said, I'm working this hard so that you can have a better life in, in America. So immigrants, I think, have this notion of coming to America for individualism. Uh, and and uh, uh, that, I think, could be a hopeful and encouraging sign. A brief word about uh, our current president. Um, it is interesting that when Donald Trump was elected, the first tweet that he sent out we used to have fireside chats, now we have tweets. The first presidential tweet he sent out, uh, as president walked, I should say, was about the forgotten men and women, and about how we'll never forget them again. And it was very much a part of his inaugural address also. And so we sort of scratched our head and we said, now when's the last time we heard a lot about the forgotten man? Um, and of course that was Franklin Roosevelt's forgotten man, for whom he wanted to build a big social safety net and protect them and redo American policy with them in mind. And we ask ourselves, is, is, it, is it the same? Is Trump going to be FDR all over again? And our answer is no. We think that Franklin Roosevelt's forgotten man was someone who had been forgotten by the economy. Um, and by the way, you, you may know the history there. The actual term uh, 
uh, forgotten man is more like the middle American who's paying taxes but doesn't really get what he or she wants out of their government. Um, so Roosevelt already sort of misused the term, if you will, um, which I hope would be good news to a Hoover uh, audience. Um, uh, but the forgotten man to Roosevelt was being forgotten by the economy. It was being beaten up by the economy. And so the forgotten man needed protections against those awful business men and women and, and the economy. Trump's forgotten men and women, he thinks, I think, are really forgotten by their own government. That their own government is failing to take care of them. That their own government is abusing them. Uh, and so it's a bit different. But what we don't know about Trump uh, yet, I would say, is whether his answer to that will be less government, less government intrusion in people's lives, or whether he turns out to be another big government Republican who really likes big government and likes debt and, and just wants to direct it in certain ways. And I can kind of give you evidence on both sides of that, and again, we may come to that in a bit. Um, I've already mentioned that, that young people, I think, are maybe a hopeful sign uh, for rugged individualism in their social networking lives. Uh, they're very much living out a form of networked individualism. In their work lives, they are much less interested in going to work for some big company in New York for 50 years, much more interested in starting their own businesses, the so-called gig economy, working in startups. That's, that's, a form of, that's a new frontier, and that's a form of, of rugged individualism. And then we close the book by saying that we really need to wake up and strengthen what remains of rugged individualism. We need to awaken to its value, um, we need to identify these liberty moments when the healthcare policy is declared illegal or when the government wants to cut your soda in half or uh, when, when, when your individual rights are being challenged. We need to guard constitutional protections like checks and balances and separations of power, not get rid of them. Uh, and we need more civic education where people have a, a deeper appreciation uh, for, for the roots and the foundations of, of our country. In the end, Gordon and I have a pretty modest argument. We think that rugged individualism at least deserves a seat at the policy table. That a lot of people came to America, were born in America, are still coming to America because they want to live a life of individualism. They don't want the church or the king and queen or the government or their social class to tell them what to do. They want to be able to make their own decisions. And more and more, we have a, a government that is reluctant to allow for that. And all we're saying is that when we make health policy, when we make education policy, we ought to leave a seat at the table because there are still people in America who are the driving forces of a lot of our businesses and societies who would like to live a life of, of rugged individuals. Well, I could, I could go on. I'm mindful uh, of the essay that the third grader uh, wrote about Socrates. He thought he could capture the subject in three sentences. He wrote, Socrates was a philosopher. Second sentence, he talked a lot. Third sentence, they poisoned him. <laughs> so, as the, uh, I've taught after lunch classes. I know this is a challenging time, so I don't, I don't want to go on too long. You can read the book, or as one of my good friends called me on the phone, he said, I just saw your book talk on C-SPAN. He said, you know what was so great about it? I said, what's that, Wally? He said, now I won't have to read the book. So, <laughs> so read the book if you want. We'll open the floor now. We've got about uh, 15 minutes or so, if, if we have interest. And uh, feel free to ask a question. Feel free to argue or make a statement, if, but try to keep it brief. Uh, so the floor is open. So if you have a question, raise your hand. We've got two wireless mics that we can hand you. So mine is partly, I guess, a statement and a brief, and partly a question. So I'm actually a congressional candidate here in the second district, and I'm a libertarian leaning Republican. And we die here. There we go. And uh, so individualism uh, comes up a lot. Of course, I, I'm trying to appeal to people from uh, independents and some people that are more on the Democratic side. You know, you got to get a broad audience of, of voters to win in this district. And so my statement is basically that some people, I think, conflate, well, progressives particularly conflate community with government. Right. I think that conservatives and libertarians tend to 
uh, look at, the, at individualism as that's all it is, and we, we tend to ignore the fact, and you didn't in your talk, that we really are integrally involved with everybody around us, right? Uh, we, uh, most of us, and rugged would be the one thing I might take out of the title, but everyone has historic value, but very few of us would uh, survive if, uh, if society fell apart. You know, we wouldn't be able to right. do all the things we need to do. So, one of the things, and this is kind of my, my question, I guess, is I think it, it is a value, and I'm wondering if you do too, when talking about this, is to is rather to present these two dichotomous options of government or individual, and just kind of emphasize, you know, we realize that we are all, you know, integrally connected, and that community is really important, and let's focus on all aspects of that, and not always, again, talking to, depending on which audience you're talking to, with progressives say, you know, not everything needs to be solved by government. I mean, talking to conservatives and libertarians, there is more than the individual right. important. No, I, of course, um, uh, I think I think a key word um, is that people should be able to consent. I would I would come back to the word consent, uh, the consent of the governed, um, and so even government can be uh, obviously legitimate. I'm not an anti-government uh, individualist, um, but I like to consent to what my government is doing. Um, I'm happy to participate in all kinds of charitable efforts, but I choose to do that. I consent to do that. Um, I, that's how I give my money away. I would rather give money myself than keep get, getting 50% of my money taxed and let, and, and let uh, the federal government give it away. So to me, a very key word is the word consent. And I think in a lot of government efforts, um, there really isn't sufficient consent. And, you know, unfortunately, we're living in a time now <laughs> where we don't even deliberate on bills and have bipartisan consent in those houses in Washington. We draft our bills in secret and we spring them at the last minute and we make sure we have 50% or 51% votes or we don't even bring it to the floor and we don't have debate and we don't have amendments and we don't have compromises. I think it's pretty hard to say that there's a broad consent uh, when that's the way we're passing bills. So I come to that word consent. It seems to me that as long, as long as people are consenting, then they're exercising their individualism. Uh, but when people aren't consenting and people and things are being done to them or for them, then I think we've moved out of the realm of, of individualism. But you're right, it's a blended society that we live in. Um, and and uh, I wouldn't, I mean, well, actually, I personally would. My, my personal philosophy at, at this stage of my life is recluse on my way to curmudgeon. <laughs> Let me just add, my wife isn't real happy about that. <laughs> She's hoping I will not succeed in that. So, uh, but most of us don't want to live that kind of life, and I understand that. Yes. Um, I actually like to sort of continue that thought on and with a question for you, Dave, because I, I really hear and appreciate where you're coming from. Um, and I actually think you capture probably the other end of the sort of uh, the curvature of our life. Um, you know, you're not a recluse on the way to curmudgeon. You're, 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 you're uh, uh, probably trying to find solutions and be creative and about sort of how, how you end up reconciling some of these opposing ideas or philosophies. and. You know, I was interested, David, as you were discussing Hoover's contribution uh, to rugged individualism, and as far as I can tell, the term itself um, was first used by Herbert Hoover in the 1920s, I believe it was in 1928, when he was running, as you said, for, for president. Right. Um, but that he had characterized the system of American individualism in this book in 1922. And in that book, one of the main components that he characterizes as critical to the American experience and America's brand of individualism is its, quote, voluntary spirit, right? That volunteerism and a sense of community belonging and a sense of responsibility and service to others was what makes America's brand of individualism different sure. than the forms of individualism he found in Europe or in Asia or, or any other part of the globe that he had traveled to prior. And in that characterization, to me, it feels that there's an answer to this millennial, sort of the paradox of being individualistic, but also at the same time deeply connected to your generation and the globe and your peers, right? That, that you can have a, a sense of responsibility for others while still serving 
um, you know, the higher purpose of, of yourself, not not because a church is telling you to or a government is telling you to. So Dave, do you, I mean, do you see that as exclusive? Or do you think that maybe in Hoover's characterization of individualism and it's the importance of voluntary service that there might be an answer to this gentleman's no, I, question? No, I, I think that's exactly right. I think I, this essay that he wrote in 1922, which I think is really one of the great pieces written about individualism, um, it, it very much is against what he saw in Europe, as you say, a, a kind of enforced um, uh, and, and sometimes selfish individualism. And that's why he calls it American individualism. It's different, Hoover says. It is voluntary. It involves the uh, equality of opportunity. Uh, there are very unique aspects in Hoover's view, and I think it's a very constructive essay. Um, to further respond, you know, kind of back to your point, one of the biggest debates my co-author and I had in drafting this book was whether to get rid of rugged, the word rugged. We knew that we wanted to defend individualism, but we were ambivalent about rugged. And, and we asked ourselves, is that one of those words of the 1920s that just doesn't translate that well today? And maybe we should go ahead and throw that overboard. And we went back and forth. And then we, tried, then we, we for a while we thought, well, we'll come up with our own word that kind of has a more modern, so, so we came up with resourceful individualism. I mean, it takes, you gotta be pretty resourceful to start new businesses and do startups and, and so forth. Um, uh, and maybe that does capture more a 21st century sense of rugged individualism, if you will. In the end, we decided to stick with the historical term, but I think that's a very fair debate. I think we, we maybe limit our audience a bit when we use that, that word from 100 years ago. I think that's very fair. Other questions, comments? This is a friendlier audience. I gave this talk at the Commonwealth Club in San Francisco, which is where Franklin Roosevelt gave his most radical uh, New Deal talk 85 years ago this fall. They were less friendly than you. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> They worked me over pretty well. Yes? Well, since you asked comments, I think it, it's probably good to uh, reflect on Hoover's background um, growing <coughs> up in, the, um, in this area, which was um, instrumental in the Underground Railroad, um, the Quakers that lived here. Um, in fact, John Brown um, trained his men like less than 20 miles from here, and some were willing to go against <coughs> even their Quaker religion, um, to, it, you know, in the interest right. of protecting slaves and um, that, that when he was 10, his parents perished and um, he was then raised by someone who, who wasn't Quaker. So it is helpful to look at the background that he came from, uh, which I would say would very much support yeah. the idea of rugged individualism. Yeah. Without question. And, and I would say even, I mean, just walking, this is my first visit here, by the way, and uh, I plan to stay over tomorrow and visit the library and take it all in. I'm very excited to be here. Um, just walking around town a little bit today, I commented to someone, you know, this is not like living in the peninsula in the Bay Area. Uh, in my view, we are so highly regulated in California. Uh, I mean, not only do they regulate the uh, amount of time I can spend in the shower, and not only do they regulate the shower head, the government that I use, but I just asked my wife if I couldn't get a different dial for them. No, it's not legal. It's not doesn't you know doesn't fit the code. I can't I can't even get the kind of dial I want. I said, you know, I think I'm just too highly regulated if I can't get my own dial in the shower. I mean, just you know. But um, my point is, I think when you have so much government regulation, it begins to crowd out the individual initiative that you still see in a place like. Hoover hometown days in West Branch, Iowa, um, and that you saw in the kind of lifestyle that Herbert Hoover, especially, would have lived here. So I think that I think I think a problem that Putnam and Bella didn't address in their sociological treatments about individualism and how they think it's selfish. I think the other side of that point is that if we depend on government to really address and solve all of our problems, I think it begins to crowd out community efforts and voluntary efforts and, and individual initiative uh, in, in solving problems. So uh, I, think, I think that's, 
And that's, you live that more, I would judge, in a place like this than we do in, in uh, Silicon Valley in California. Yes? Uh, I love the emphasis on volunteering, but how... He's got a uh, microphone for thank you. Thank you. Uh, yep. I, I love the um, emphasis on volunteering, but how do you how do you solve the conflict between you're talking about the showerhead in California uh, individualism and overregulation versus tragedy of the commons when we have so many more people now and I am a millennial and I am concerned about the sort of resources that we'll have when you know 20 years from now 30 years from now. Uh, how how do we solve that conflict? How do we maintain our individualism while uh, still taking care of, a, of the community? Yeah, no, I mean, that's uh, clearly, uh, that is an increasingly challenging uh, issue. We're well past the frontier days now. We have to live within the space uh, that we have. Um, again, I come back to the notion of, of debate and deliberation about things. Uh, it seems to me that one of the qualities that we've lost in this country is our ability to deliberate about important issues. Um, and I mean deliberation of all kinds. I mean deliberation in neighborhoods and communities. And one of the efforts I have worked on in California and I continue to work on are various efforts to allow communities to work on and solve their own problems. Um, they need some tools to help them do that. And there are some remarkable tools now for local and regional deliberation where you can involve whole communities in deciding, you know, if we have to cut something, are we going to cut library hours or are we going to, I mean, what do we value as a community? And what, what, what do we, so that sort of deliberation even at the community level to solve community problems and then deliberation at the highest levels. Uh, in the United States Senate, which is supposed to be the world's greatest deliberative body, but it doesn't deliberate anymore. You know, it goes to war and, and, and does, it does uh, up or down votes and so forth. So I think all of that, I think the notion of, of deliberation is the solution, to, in my view. And we have to learn to deliberate again and to hear each other out uh, and to allow communities to make the decisions that are reasonable for communities to make to enable the federal government to deliberate again. I happened, I wrote a column about this and got boot and hiss, but I happened to support John McCain's decision uh, because of the way he said it. He said, you know, we've got to get past the idea that we're just looking for 50 Republican votes to change Obamacare. Even though, as he said, that's how the Democrats passed it in the first place. That was also wrong, but it's also wrong for us to just decide. But we need to have a deliberative conversation that involves a lot of people to make the most important decision probably made about domestic policy in the last 50 years. So that would be my answer. And again, what's the point of deliberation? It's to, it's to find consent. That's how the democracy has to work. The consent of the people locally, the consent of the people in the Senate. We're not looking for that anymore. So that's my answer. I don't think it's easy, I don't, but that to me, that's where we should be working instead of having more and more wars and fights and battles and votes and filibusters and all that sort of thing. I think deliberation is what we've got to get back to. And that's the book, by the way, that Gordon and I are working on next. Mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> uh, the working title of the book is How uh, How Did Public Policy Become War and Not Deliberation? Because we think war is now the metaphor and, and it's not deliberation. So that's the book we're working on now. My boss is right behind me. I'm looking to see if he's applauding. <laughs> <laughs> Just kidding. Yes. <coughs> Tom, I'm watching the time. I think this might be the uh, word. Uh, no, one word that keeps coming to me as this discussion is going on is uh, another word that's really a catch word is sustainability. So I kind of like sustainable individualism because I don't believe that government. Where, where were you when we needed you? <laughs> That'll be for the next edition. No, I, I just instinctively, it's a great idea. But it has kind of double meaning, right. and, it, and it borrows kind of like a word from the left to go to the right. That's a good title. It's called Collaboration. It's not going to get any better than that. Thank you very much. Appreciate your attention and interest. Thank you.